Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I want to start by saying thank you so much for the invitation to come here. It's been really interesting hearing all the talks um, over the last few days, and I've been making small changes to my presentation. So there'll be a little bit of impro improvisation in response to some of the things I've been hearing. Um, just to introduce myself, I am a sociocultural anthropologist who studies transnational communities, so studies transnational field sciences. So the project I'm going to be talking about today um, is one to do with archaeologists. Um, and I'm going to be presenting some work that, the field work that I conducted um, a few years back, but the ideas I'm going to be talking about are, um, are some new ideas that I'm playing with and I wanted to sort of uh, have an opportunity to present today. Um, okay, so the themes of this um, uh, conference that have been really interesting to me have been thinking about this. Uh, we've all been asked to think about the changing circumstances of archaeological practice. And so far most of us have been thinking about change in terms of sort of like things getting more technological or something happening that's in a sort of forward direction. But what I want to do today is think about a different kind of change, which is a sort of, some change is circular um, and cyclical. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm gonna be thinking about rather than thinking of things that, that are, are moving in a progress, but what does cyclicality do to the way we think about archeological knowledge? Um, and this is an image that sort of jumps in my head this morning in that um, we can, and, and this will be a theme that's gonna come up throughout uh, my talk, is that you can have the structure of something that's circular, but it can manifest in many different ways. Um, and that idea, uh, that very anthropological idea of looking for both similarity and difference and trying to understand how things can be structurally the same uh, but mean something different, it's really at the heart of the work uh, I want to present to you today. So to introduce the project I'm gonna be talking about, um, uh, I conducted a multi-sided ethnography of several different archeological communities uh, in 2008 to 2011, which feels a very long time ago now. Nobody was using iPods. Uh, none of the technology that we've been talking about over the last few days was even really um, on the horizon and couldn't be used in these sites because of the high altitude. Um, so, so that's something interesting about that. Um, so the project I, I did was a comparison of several different archeological communities. Um, I was looking at Chilean archeologists who work in Chile um, in their universities, their excavations, the conferences they have, and also US and Canadian archeologists who excavate in Bolivia. And then I had this case study that I'll be talking quite a bit about today of a US archeological field school, which set up in the north of Chile and then had to relocate. Um, so uh, something that makes my work maybe a little bit different is that I wasn't just looking at sites of excavation or analysis. My questions were really about what makes an archeological community in the whole. So what does the work archeologists do the rest of the time when they're not in the field? And how does that also um, lead to knowledge production? So something I'm gonna come back to uh, quite, quite a few times is this idea that um, to understand how we make archeological knowledge, we can't just look at the processes through which we make data. Uh, data is not knowledge. Um, even the analysis of data is not knowledge. But knowledge make, making practices in archeology span occur in many different spaces. They're occurring now in this room as we're talking to each other and we're presenting our research. This is the way that we are crafting and thinking about what knowledge is. Uh, we make knowledge through our teaching and our mentoring. We make it when, through our writing and uh, the way that our journals and, and publications circulate. We make it through the way that we judge each other's um, work when we're doing peer review or judging grant applications. And we also are making knowledge in the kind of informal conversations you've all been having in the coffee breaks that sometimes you'll be having in the bar that we have in all of these different spaces. So all of the other work that we do as archeologists is also part of the process of making archeological knowledge. And that's why I spent uh, nearly two years looking not just at excavations, but at pe what people are doing in universities, in conferences, and in all these other kind of spaces as well. So the big argument, um, if I could summarize the whole project in sort of a couple of sentences, and the message I really uh, I want to get across is that um, there is this assumption in every science that there is a universal, universalism, so that what it means to be an archeologist in one country is comparable with what it means to be an archeologist somewhere else. And the intervention that I make with my work is that in fact, um, although archeology span has a similar structure in different places, the content is different. And it is this, um, uh, 
a contrast between things that look very similar but actually are enacted in different ways um, that leads to sometimes um, uh, difficulties when people work together. So some sort of examples of what I mean by that. So it could be different expectations of, of how we think about students and what the role of students are. Um, the appropriate scope of a research question or a research project, like in one country, uh, not like in the North American projects I study, they do enormous great big projects with very large anthropological questions um, in contrast to much more empirical, smaller focus projects. And each uh, community thinks of this as the most appropriate thing to do. Um, uh, different kind of questions about how one excavates that appear to be common sense in one place don't necessarily carry over elsewhere and so on. Um, so, uh, the, in answer to the big question that I set with my research, why is it that transnational collaborations sometimes fail? My argument is that they falter when there is this expectation that people from the same discipline but working in different countries share a single epistemic culture. They share a single understanding of how to make knowledge, what it means to be an archaeologist. And there is this assumption of similarity, and when that assumption, assumption is not met, or when it meets resistance, that's when conflict happens. Okay, so that is the sort of big picture of the project. And today I'm going to uh, try and illustrate this for you with a concrete example because everything is very abstract what I've said so far. So I'm going to uh, structure this talk by, by starting to tell you about the two case studies that are uh, the primary case studies of my research. Um, then thinking about um, why archaeology is a really interesting way to think about um, what it means to practice a science on a global context because it's both a field science and a social or humanistic science. Um, then I'm going to start thinking about the seasonal and temporal rhythms of uh, field work as my main example. And then at the end, I'll sort of sum up with some conclusions on why uh, collaborations of this kind fail. Okay, so here's the sad bit, right. <laughs> Um, why do transnational collaborations go wrong? And the two examples I have, one is a very dramatic breakdown in communication, and the other is a project that on the surface appeared to be going extremely well, um, but underneath there were all these simmering kind of tensions. Um, so to just sort of situate you a little bit in, in where we are, let me see. So here is Bolivia up here, and this is Chile. And I'm going to be talking about um, the city of La Paz, which is the biggest, uh, well, the main city in Bolivia. It's not actually the capital city. Um, it's up in the Altiplano, which is the, the high, dry plains um, between the mountains in the, in the Bolivian Andes. Um, and the excavations I'm going to be talking about were also in the Altiplano region. And the thing you need to know about that is, of course, it's in the Southern Hemisphere. So the winter is in June and July. The dry season is around May to June. Um, it's a very cool climate, but very high altitude. So you have the situation where if you stand still for too long, one side of your body is getting sunburnt and the other side of your body in the shade is freezing cold. It's a, it's a very weird place. Um, and the other place I'm gonna be talking about is Chile. Um, here. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about the capital of Chile is Santiago, you can see here on the map, and also the Chilean Atacama Desert, which is at the top there. Um, uh, fun fact, it's the second driest place on Earth, and the first driest place is Antarctica. That's my one fun fact for pub quizzes that I can never remember. Okay. So um, I'm going to start by talking about these North American projects uh, in Bolivia. So there is a long history of North Americans, uh, particularly people from the US, doing Andeanist research uh, in South America, particularly in Bolivia and Peru. Now in Bolivia, in this particular region in, in the Altiplano, um, around a site called Tiwanaku, um, there have been North Americans working there for many decades. I mean, you can, you can trace it back to the 50s, but the, the modern period of excavations has been almost uninterrupted excavations there since the 1970s. Um, and at the time when I was doing my field work in 2008, the situation was that um, very few Bolivian archeologists actually had the resources or the opportunity to conduct excavations of their own. So the normal pattern of practicing archaeology, if you are a Bolivian archaeologist, is to be employed on a foreign excavation. Um, so there, and when there were Bolivian archaeological projects, because the entire discipline had been shaped by this uh, generations-long tradition of North American excavations, 
the, the idea of what archaeology is was very much modeled on the work that had been done by North Americans over several decades. Um, the, as, as I've written about in some of my other publications, the thing that's interesting about these excavations is that they usually include an enormous number of indigenous field technicians who in many cases have been working for archaeologists for generations. So it's not just that the old man has been working uh, for the last 30 years as a field archaeologist, uh, but also his father did and his daughter does and his wife does and the grandmother does. And entire communities are employed um, each year on archaeological excavations. And they are extremely respected for the skills that they have, uh, particularly uh, there are certain people who are known and, and the relationship they have with the archaeologists. So it's always an archaeologist and an indigenous, uh, what they call a maestro, a master who work together. It's a very respectful, collaborative uh, project. Um, but in contrast, the sort of um, designation of archaeologist includes the, uh, both Bolivian archaeologists who are there working for pay and receiving a wage, and North American archaeologists who are either researchers or graduate students coming down to Bolivia um, who pay their own way to be there and don't get paid, uh, but instead have research opportunities. So in terms of the relationship with the indigenous communities here, these are Aymara communities. Um, because the work has been going on in Tiwanaku for so long, there is a very established way of practicing archaeology and working with communities here. Um, there is the Tiwanaku Archaeological Workers' Union, which is very powerful. Um, if you want to work in Tiwanaku, you have to negotiate wages and so on with the union. Um, the communities own the land, uh, uh, so if there's ever any um, unhappiness about how archaeologists are working, they refuse permission to continue working. So it's a, it's a situation that um, involves a lot of collaboration and compromise and often extremely long meetings um, that go on for, for hours and hours, but eventually people come to um, uh, a, a collaborative and, and mutually uh, beneficial sort of a relationship here. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this part of the world is that uh, many ethnographers over many years have documented how uh, Aymara communities in this part of the world um, don't necessarily have what we would think of as a straightforward understanding of their relationship with the, uh, particularly the human remains that are being excavated because they see themselves as Christian. Uh, they don't necessarily see um, the remains that are being excavated as their ancestors. However, there is a concern about the pollution that can happen by disturbing the earth. So um, uh, rituals always take place, and this is an example of um, an offering being prepared in the artifact processing lab um, and then taken outside and, and burnt uh, during a ritual ceremony to um, guard against the pollution from the ground, from Mother Earth, rather than necessarily any concern about ancestors. Um, the other thing to, to know about this place is that Tiwanaku, uh, for the people who live there, they derive an enormous amount of pride from, from this particular monument being um, a center of national identity, particularly national neo-indigenous neo identity since the election of Evo Morales as the president of Bolivia. He was the first indigenous um, president in Bolivia, uh, in South America, sorry, and he had his inauguration ceremony at this archaeological site. Um, but it's also a huge uh, driver of the economy. However, so I was interested when I first arrived at thinking about the relationships between the indigenous communities here in Bolivia and uh, the archaeologists. However, when I arrived, I realized that actually there's a really productive collaboration that's been going on for many decades. But what instead I found was this um, underlying sense of uh, tension among the archaeologists themselves that can be best expressed as like a sort of routine experience of microaggressions, which is a wonderful term that actually totally encapsulates uh, uh, what I was finding, where the Bolivian archaeologists found themselves um, uh, feeling excluded from interpretive processes, unable to get their points of view across, feeling that the North American perspectives on the archaeology were constantly being prioritized. Um, and this is the thing that I ended up wanting to study and, and to investigate, because what appeared on the surface to be um, a very happy project <laughs> with really uh, people who had uh, uh, the best intentions in terms of working um, uh, ethically with the local indigenous community, there was actually this tension going on between the archaeologists that was very unusual. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, the, 
the, the way that I explain this is by thinking about when the archaeologists from the US and from Canada arrived in Bolivia, they expected to encounter difference, cultural difference. They expected to encounter something different with the indigenous communities, and they were prepared to encounter a different kind of culture, we might say. But when um, Bolivian and North American archaeologists work together, they expect to be equals. They expect to each understand, as archaeologists, um, each other's perspectives and motivations. Um, and this um, uh, expectation of, of, of a shared understanding, when it actually meets difference, is where conflict occurs. Okay. So uh, the second example I'm going to talk about is a field school which uh, set up in the north of Chile um, that I studied in 2008 as well. Um, the thing to know about Chile is that uh, they had this dictatorship from 1973 to 1990, and during this period there were very few um, foreign projects allowed into Chile. Um, archaeology was allowed to continue uh, despite the persecution of, of academics and scientists during the dictatorship. Um, but for the, because the country was closed off to foreign researchers, uh, except for a very few exceptions, Chilean archaeology developed its own kind of thing uh, in contrast to neighboring communities in Bolivia and Peru. Um, uh, it has its own research funding. It, it's based mostly in the very prestigious Universidad de Chile. Um, so the, the contrast with the Bolivian and Peruvian situation is that Chilean archaeology was really uh, quite independent. Um, the field school that I was studying was one of the first to uh, set up in Chile uh, since the return to democracy in 1990, so it was a very unusual thing. Um, the field school was uh, funded and directed by n U.S. archaeologists who had been working for many years in southern Peru and wanted to come and work in, on the other side of the border, but in the same part of the Atacama Desert. And they collaborated with a local Chilean archaeologist, but they ran an archaeological field school. Um, and the material that they were working on was uh, because the Atacama Desert is so dry, the preservation um, in this part of the world is absolutely exceptional. It's really incredible. Um, and there are these mummy bundles that had been disturbed by um, the, uh, somebody putting in a road, and the project was there to try and um, uh, preserve and conserve uh, these mummy bundles. And it, but the, the archaeology here is, a, is, is really spectacular. Um, the other thing they were looking at was rock art, so there's some wonderful pictures uh, over here of the rock art, and these are members of the local community helping some of the archaeologists to find uh, rock art sites uh, near the excavation. So the thing that originally attracted me to, to looking at this field school project that I thought was really interesting is when the archaeologists had started to work there, they had a lot of experience of working in Peru, where there are indigenous Aymara and Quechua communities. Um, but the, their understanding was that there aren't really that many indigenous communities in Chile just across the border. This is because um, over the last hundred years there had been this process of um, active repression of indigenous people in Chile called forced Chilenization, uh, particularly during the dictatorship. And so the people and the communities in this part of the country don't look indigenous. So when they arrived, they didn't expect to have um, uh, any issues with people objecting to the excavation of mummies. So they were very surprised when uh, the, the community they were in um, did, in fact, object to the excavation of mummies. And in contrast to the kind of things you see in Aymara communities, the very iconic Aymara communities in Bolivia in places like Tiwanaku, the local people here claimed that these mummies were their ancestors, and they were very upset about the disturbance of them. Now, the archaeologists, having not expected this kind of response, immediately halted the excavation. They consulted with the local um, community leaders, with the local ritual leaders, with the priests. Um, they came to an agreement. They came to an understanding. Um, again, you can see the kind of um, ritual um, uh, ceremonies involving burning offerings that took place. And the, it, in a sense, it was almost like a case study in how to successfully um, deal with these kind of conflicts uh, or when they arise unexpectedly. So I, I was very interested in this. However, before I got a chance to really start investigating this, um, the entire project blew up. <laughs> Um, there was what was later described to me by many different people on both sides of this argument as uh, a showdown at the national conference in Chile um, where there was an enormous argument, um, uh, the relationship between the U.S. directors of the project and the Chilean archaeologists who are hosting them 
absolutely broke down. It was very acrimonious, and the project left Chile under this very dark cloud and relocated back to Peru. And so my project ended up becoming like, what happened? And what, how can we understand why this occurred? When I asked the North American archeologists, they would say, well, Chileans are nationalist, they're irrational, they have misplaced jealousy um, at the US. Um, uh, and the Chileans in response would say, well, these gringos are just coming here trying to buy our patrimony. They wanna treat our mummies like tourism for their students. It was very um, um, unpleasant on both sides. So in 2008, just after this had happened, I was at a, uh, I was giving a presentation at the Society of American Anthropologists Conference in the US. And I would presented my work on Chile, and at the end I wanted to talk a little bit about the Chilean project. Um, sorry, I would presented my work on Bolivia, and I wanted to talk about it. Um, and n knowing that uh, there were members of the Chilean archaeological community in the audience um, at this conference, I decided it would be diplomatic not to mention <laughs> the big bust up that had occurred at the conference. And instead I talked about this interesting situation with this uh, reclaimed indigenous identity uh, among the local uh, indigenous community. This turned out to be the wrong thing to do. Um, I received a summons from the director of the North American Project who called me into the hotel room and berated me for half an hour about how um, uh, disrespectful I was and how terrible it was that I was bringing his project into disrepute by daring to mention this situation, which had been unexpected and peacefully resolved. So as an ethnographer, um, I thought about this afterwards and I started to think, what does this incident, what does this ethnographic incident at this conference tell us about who is considered offendable? Um, and the ethics and the, the value systems embedded in archaeological practice in this part of the world. Um, what I uh, came to the understanding of is that it, it's, it's from his perspective, the idea that even if a conflict with an indigenous community was unexpected and resolved, even the slightest mention of it could potentially cause him reputational damage. And from this I take the, the, the message that the lessons of indigenous critiques of archaeology from the 1980s and 90s onwards have been learned and have caused a change in the way that people think about what is acceptable practice um, in this part of the world. But in contrast, the fact that um, he didn't see any problem with talking about the conflict that had with the Chilean archaeologists, in fact, he told me that I ought to have put all the blame on them because they were so irrational um, and should have mentioned that instead, tells me that, um, th and this is something I then saw throughout the rest of my fieldwork uh, over the next couple of years, is that conflict with local in, um, uh, archaeologists uh, uh, in the country of origin is not only to be expected, um, it's expected that you'll clash with them, but uh, the fact that you disagree with them is somehow showing your own ration superior rationality in, in contrast to the nationalism um, of local archeologies span and other parts of the world. So um, what I take from this is the idea that the post-colonial critiques of archeology span have not yet extended to recognizing disparities of power between nations and particularly between the global north and global south. So uh, the words nationalism and imperialism were thrown around a lot in my field work um, and uh, elsewhere I sort of unpack those ideas a little bit more. But here I want to think about um, this core question of rather than blaming individuals uh, and particular people's politics or personalities for these kind of disagreements, what are the structures and cultures of archeological field work that make these kind of disagreements um, either inevitable or likely? So why do these kind of uh, both microaggression uh, situations and also the big dramatic, the big dramatic uh, conflicts are quite rare, I should say. Um, but why do these kind of uh, problems occur? Okay. So from the perspective of the anthropology of science or from science and technology studies, archaeology is really fascinating. It's a really interesting um, discipline to study because it's both a social science and a humanistic science, but it's also a field science. And I should say that whenever I use the word science with archaeological audiences, sometimes people get a little twi twitchy, um, but just, you know, I'm not thinking about um, science in a sort of objectivist, uh, uh, scientific kind of way. It's just kind of a shorthand for saying expert knowledge making communities, which is a bit too much of a mouthful. Okay, so what is it that makes archeology span interesting? The first is this idea that it's a field science. Uh, as uh, Matt Edwards was saying um, just yesterday, the traditional studies of how uh, scientific knowledge of 
are produced um, originally all came from lab sciences and uh, talked about how scientific knowledge is different from other kind of knowledge because it's produced in this um, controlled space of a laboratory and as we all know the field is totally uncontrollable the, the winds can blow everything away people can walk across your site your site is also a tourist attraction or somebody's field it's it's the exact opposite of the controlled space of a lab um, but I'm also interested in the way that, as a social and humanistic science, archaeology has embraced or is at least aware of the kind of self-reflexive critiques um, that we saw in these relationships with indigenous people. So to go back to this model of, uh, that I showed a little bit earlier on in terms of thinking about how knowledge in archaeology is not only produced in the field, but it's also produced in these other kind of practices, these other kind of spaces. Um, I'm going to be uh, trying to think about what is it the, about the field that enables the production of archaeological knowledge, but in relationship to the non-field, in relationship to the movement in and out of the field, and the, the different divisions between the kind of ways you can be an archaeologist and make archaeological knowledge in the field in contrast to the practices we have outside of the field. Um, so uh, various publications uh, I've already got out there or that I uh, will be coming out fairly soon, have looked at the way the field and the non-field are sort of situated in relationship to each other and, and construct a space for producing scientific knowledge um, in terms of the scientific practices, the manipulation of objects, inscription on the landscape, and also the, an idea of uh, performative informality, so the particular ways of drinking culture and socializing that archaeologists have. But today what I want to focus on is the actual uh, movement of through space and in space and the cyclicality of that. And this is kind of a new set of ideas for me, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. So, um, yeah, so I'm thinking about these, these uh, concepts of seasonality and temporality and cyclicality as an example of the kind of non-universal common sense structures that I talked about before. Um, where their structure looks similar. If you think back to that circle, the structure looks similar, but they uh, manifest or are enacted in different ways in different places. So again, I'm talking about you know, these places, just to remind you where we are. Um, so what kind of movements am I thinking about? So um, the first kind of cyclical movement is obviously the movement into and out of the field. So for North American archaeologists who live and study in the US for most of the year, they travel to Bolivia for one to three months during their academic summer vacation. So that would be around May to July when their um, universities are, are closed. In contrast, Bolivian archaeologists, in, um, uh, they live and study in La Paz in the major city throughout the year. And the kind of cyclical movements they're making are not from one country to the other country, but rather from the um, urban site of La Paz into the rural excavation site during the week. And then on the weekends, they return back to their family homes. Most people live with their families, either their parents and extended um, sibling networks or with their, you know, their partner and so on. Um, so there's a cyclicality to that kind of movement. That's a more traditional kind of work week uh, cycle. In contrast, the Chilean archaeologists um, live and study in Santiago and their movement in and out of the field is a movement from Santiago to rural excavation sites. But rather than going for one period um, for a couple of months in the summer, um, they go for multiple um, uh, periods of excavation. They're usually around one or two weeks throughout the academic year. So they might just stop classes, disappear for a week, come back, and disappear for two weeks, come back again. So it's a different kind of movement and a, and a, a different kind of cyclicality. To give you an idea of what some of this um, contrast looks like, there's this movement from urban to rural um, in Bolivia. So Bolivia is um, um, a colonial city. It has both colonial architecture and lots of uh, modern architecture. It's a huge city. It's a really fun, exciting city. Um, in contrast, Tiwanaku is, even though it's a town and it's a very popular tourist destination, it's a very rural place. Most people's uh, primary employment is farming, um, supplemented with archaeology. Uh, so that's that, what that kind of movement looks like. Um, Chile, the Santiago is an extremely cosmopolitan city. Um, uh, one of the, you know, Chile is one of the richer countries in South America. And the movement there is from this, uh, again, from urban to rural, from um, the urban uh, side of uh, Santiago into, again, a rural uh, part of the country 
um, where most people are doing agriculture. So for, for North Americans, there's this other movement that's a much longer distance. Um, again, it's a movement usually from urban to rural, but the additional um, uh, perspective on that is it's a movement across a national border. So here is a picture of Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I am, um, into Tiwanaku. So it's a different kind of movement through space um, that combines both the movement across urban and rural, but also uh, this idea of moving across national boundaries. The other kind of cyclical rhythms that I want to, to think about are this difference between academic and work seasons. So for the North American archaeologists who work with, it, with Bolivians in Bolivia, the North Americans who are the directors of these projects are going during their summer vacation, which is from about May to July. But the Bolivian university system doesn't match up exactly with the North American um, uh, university system. So often their universities are still in session in May and June, so archaeologists who go and work on these projects are often having to go home, um, go back to attend classes, to take exams, or to work. So there, there's a mismatch there in terms of um, their requirements of being in university and their normal uh, life, as it were, within their classes, but also undertaking this paid work on excavations in Tiwanaku. In contrast, the Chilean projects um, and this kind of fantastic system where they just up and leave in the middle of classes, um, which I, 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 I have other work a lot t talking about, like what kind of academic culture there is in Chile. But this idea of they just cancel classes and disappear for a week and their students may or may not know that they're not around anymore. Um, and they don't work during their vacations. The vacation is December to February but they work during the academic year, so it's more um, uh, keeping work within this professional time and, and going to do excavations, being extension of one's professional work rather than impacting on one's uh, vacation time. Um, the other kind of cyclical movements that I'm, I'm interested in, this relates to my interest in sociality um, and uh, marking distinctions between the, the field and other kinds of spaces in terms of uh, what one does in those places is moving from this idea of the university as a workplace to the field as a place of play and informality and um, uh, slightly wild drinking and whatever else goes on in the field that stays in the field. Um, and of course, we, we have to sort of mention this, this idea that the field is um, in many ways, despite people's best intentions, often experienced and conceptualized as an immer mergement, um, sorry, immersement into indigeneity with the uh, potential con connotation of the rural and the indigenous being conceptualized as the less modern. And I think I want to um, uh, uh, give the benefit of the doubt to all of my informants that they would both critique this and recognize this as problematic and yet still experience it um, as this sense of a movement almost back into a, a le less modern time period by immersing themselves in um, the indigenous uh, rural experience. So these different kind of examples I've given of these cyclical movements um, across t time and space, uh, what I would say is a way in which the field itself is made as a particular kind of space uh, a particular kind of space for making archaeological knowledge that isn't exactly the same as a lab space, but it still marks out a particular space and uh, period of time and experience as different in some way from the experience of being back home in the university, whatever that may be. Um, so the field is enacted through uh, as a place of indigeneity, a place of play, um, but significantly a place that is separate from the home of the university. And it's, it's through these cyclical movements uh, across time and space that you get this kind of contrast between the indigenous and rural, urban and modern work and play, but also between North and South. Okay. But I think uh, one thing that really comes across here is that although there is a similar structure um, of cyclical movements, and this is the way that the field is being enacted and constructed, uh, the different and archaeological communities are doing this differently. It, it's not exactly the same thing. For, and, and significantly, for the North American archaeologist, the field that is being enacted is not just the excavation site, but it becomes all of South America in the summer. It becomes this particular period of time, which covers several months, 
um, it becomes a particular experience of being not just in a rural site, but in being in South America itself. So La Paz becomes the field, Santiago becomes the field. Um, in contrast to the Bolivian and the Chilean archaeologists where the field is, uh, well, so places like La Paz or Santiago are their home. Um, and the field is, is constructed for the Bolivians as a place that is a place more marked as a place of, of uh, weekly employment in contrast to going home at the weekends and back to one's normal life at the weekends. Um, and as I mentioned before for the Chileans, because they're still working within the academic year and having this different kind of rhythm to the way that they move, um, it's not this place out of time so much uh, as, a, as a place of play and vacation, but rather an extension of professional practice to a certain extent. So again, yeah, so going back to this, con this idea of like the separation between the field and the university and trying to think how to make that. The point I want to sort of take from this is to, to really uh, emphasize the point that the field for one group of archaeologists is the home for another group of archaeologists. Um, and the implication of this way in which the field becomes not just the rural excavation site, but the whole of Latin America or the whole of Bolivia um, in a particular period of time is that if we think back to um, this sort of conceptual separation, between that I've said is really important in terms of um, making the separation between the place of data production and the place of knowledge creation as being a separation between the field and the university. It means that the local archaeologists, the local universities, their conferences, everything about the home of Chilean and Bolivian archaeologists is immersed as the, it's sort of in, enacted as the field for North American archaeologists, um, to the extent that local archaeologists become associated with the process of data production, uh, sorry, data collection, rather than necessarily these uh, other processes of knowledge creation and collaboration and analysis, um, the work of writing and so on, because they're uh, uh, physically and tempora temporarily uh, located in the field, so to speak. So if we think back to this question of why do collaborations fail, I said that I wanted to move beyond this idea of just blaming um, personal, pol per personal politics or, or particular individuals or their nationalistic tendencies or the imperialistic tendencies, instead to look at the structures and cultures of archaeological fieldwork that make, um, uh, that sort of reproduce these kinds of inequalities. And again, I, I come back to, to emphasize this point that conflicts arise when there are unmet expectations of similarity. So in the example from the, uh, uh, in the way that archaeologists dealt with the, in, the indigenous communities in both uh, case studies, they expected to encounter different epistemologies, uh, different ways of valuing the past, different ways of thinking about the past, and they found it. Um, so they are ready to compromise and to come up with solutions. But when um, there is the expectation that all archaeologists our colleagues and therefore are similar and should be working on a similar understanding of what is good science. When they encounter difference, there is inevitably this um, uh, uh, reaction to say, well, the way they're doing it is wrong. Um, uh, I know that well, I'm not doing it wrong, so they must be doing it wrong and what they're doing. If I encounter difference, it's bad archaeology. Um, so to sort of summarize what I've been saying here, the field is enacted through these cyclical rhythms of time and space. Um, but different archaeological communities enact this, this structural, cyclical movement in different kinds of ways. And this leads to these expectations of similarity that are not met. But I think the important point to um, emphasize here, because I think that sense of expectations of universalism not being met can be found whenever archaeologists from different countries work together. Um, so if an uh, archaeologist from Germany and the UK and the US all got together, they would probably disagree on what good normal excavation practice were, is and so on. But the difference is, is that we can't divorce um, these kind of disagreements from the larger geopolitical um, relationships between the global north and global south. And what you find is that inevitably, if somebody is wrong, it's going to be the person in the, in the global south rather than the person in the global north. Um, because of this way in which local archaeologists become part of the field. So I want to end on sort of positive notes and think for uh, pointers for the future um, in terms of like, so how can we make better collaborations? And um, because this is a conference devoted to thinking about ethnography of archaeology, 
um, I want to encourage everyone, think like an anthropologist. Um, expect to encounter difference. Um, and when you do encounter difference, presume good intent and that there is a logic behind what appears to not be common sense. Because it's all about this, it's not about big dramatic differences in most cases. It's about these underlying misunderstandings of things that seem so mundane and are so black boxed um, that they're almost not considered worthy of, of um, uh, uh, unpacking, right? Um, and the other sort of like conclusion I take in thinking about the main topics we've been discussing here is that the kind of problems I've been talking about couldn't be solved by technology. Um, and many of the, the digital approaches we've been thinking about are not able to resolve the kinds of differences and, and conflicts that I've been talking about today. But I would also say that, that throwing money at this problem would not solve it either, right? Um, and in terms of thinking about the changing circumstances of archaeological practice, that was uh, the question we were all set um, to, to approach here. I want to sort of focus back on what is not changing, right? Um, in this uh, cyclical movement, um, uh, what hasn't changed uh, uh, over the last 10 years or 50 years or however long um, that might be able to uh, uh, impact the kind of disagreements I've been looking at. Um, the, the university um, as an institution is not changing, right? That's not gonna change by technology. Who ends up in the classroom, either who we select as students, but also who makes it to the position of being a professor, of being an academic, that is not changing. Um, the bias that exists around the world towards English language publications and the implications of that, not just for people in South America, but I'm sure for many of you from Europe, um, uh, that hasn't changed, right? But I also want to encourage everyone to think, you know, you might not be working in, in South America, but from some of the conversations I've been having here um, over the last couple of days, who is your global South, right? Um, who is being precluded from being part of the non-field sites of knowledge production in the work that you're doing, um, as well as who's being included. And with that, I want to say thank you, and uh, any questions? <laughs>Yes, please. Thanks, Mary. That was fantastic. Um, my uh, question, or one of the, I'm sure, to be many questions, uh, concerns this idea that um, archaeologists come in expecting universality and they um, encounter these clashes with what they find when there's other approaches. And I think your case study is, is really interesting um, given like the histories that, that lead to that specific context. But you raise at the end the idea that um, this happens in other settings as well where there aren't these kind of, uh, I don't know, like global histories necessarily going on. Early on in the, in the talk, the issue of the field as being like uncontrollable. Um, and so I was wondering if you have thought at all about or if you might uh, want to, I don't know, talk out loud about um, the role that the actual physical like, material plays in creating those, those tensions. Because I think also th these things come up when people say like, well, I've worked on such and such a site and this is how we did it. And you know, then they move to a different kind of site. So um, Matt in the first uh, keynote raised the idea that the material um, like evidence itself shapes how we behave. And so I'm wondering if you thought about that at all. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, here I want to point to my examples from Chile in the desert, because digging in the desert is real hard. <laughs> it's like really fine sand. And I, you know, I used to be an archaeologist. I had a lot of experience doing archaeology, and I have never encountered anything like this. In terms of the, the field pushing back, like that was exactly what I was thinking of when I was on these field sites, because you're trying to, 
you, you, you know, you, you, you do this with your trowel and the sand just goes <laughs> and you, you, How do you make a section if there's no structure to the thing you're excavating? So I had a lot of respect for the archeologists who work there, but there's definitely, um, in terms of thinking about how do you make your methodology and your way of thinking about how you create archeological knowledge in um, a material site that is so uncontrollable that that nothing is, everything is fluid, right? The sand is completely fluid. And you're trying to really quickly see what color it is before it gets just covered over again. So it's a very different kind of archeology. span and, and the techniques that they were using, I think you could see that there were, there were very standard archeological techniques, but at the same time, you have to adapt the way you excavate to the materiality that you encounter, right? The other contrast would be um, in uh, Bolivia, where they were trying to use particular kinds of technology, um, but the altitude is such that um, everything just got screwed up. <laughs> and machines don't work, and they get full of dirt and dust. But there's something about the altitude that also technology is, is not friendly to, uh, doesn't function properly. So there, when I think about uncontrollability, those are the kinds I'm thinking of, uh, things I'm thinking of. I think of the wind. I'm thinking of the national strike, which blocks all the roads so no one can get in and out. I'm thinking of the festival that arrives so that all the workers don't want to come into work that day because there's a festival going on. But also the material, like that, that's material, as well as like the sand and the wind and, and the rain and whatever else it might be. Does that answer the question? You think? Okay, great, thanks. Thanks so much for a very fascinating talk, really. Uh, so I was, I was really intrigued by the way in which you analyze this clash between the Chilean archaeologists and the Global North archaeologists, and uh, how it somehow, I mean, it appeared almost as uh, li like a construction of this uh, kind of binary of uh, uh, reason, rationality on the one side, and unreason uh, on the other side, and all these bi you know, bipolarities that we could see, I guess, very much from the viewpoint of the northern archaeologists, you know, the, the global north archaeologists, like uh, objectivity versus intersubjectivity and how this is constructed, neutrality versus uh, non-neutrality and uh, positionality on the other side. So I was wondering if this kind of uh, polar opposition in, in the way in which uh, the discourses were constructed, that the intentionalities were constructed and what they did and their understandings of the clash uh, was also transcending to the other side. What would the Chilean side think of these things? Would they really aspire to the same kind of constructs or some different ones? And the second thing that goes with it, are these kinds of uh, mutual positionings versus reason, unreason, et cetera, et cetera, also transcend to the way in which they work with time, with tools, et cetera? Yeah. Um, uh, of course, everyone thinks that they're the rational one and everyone thinks that they're the more scientific one. Um, and you've touched on something that I think is really interesting um, and that I've been writing about in a paper I hope is going to come out soon um, in terms of the way in which um, accusations of nationalism and imperialism um, have almost been, like the, the, lit the very classic literature on nationalism and archaeology um, and colonialism and archaeology from the 80s and 90s, uh, post processual archaeology, um, has circulated around the world. And because everybody reads these texts, right, that were written about Israel or about Germany um, or about British work in Africa, and they become almost weaponized as a way to critique one's colleagues. So the um, director of the Chilean project would send me reading lists of like Trigger and Nadia, Nadia Abul al Haj and uh, you know, all these other classic texts as a way of saying like, well, look, they're just nationalists because they don't like foreigners, right? Um, and that was fascinating to me because what it implies is that um, the US is non-nationalist, right? It's above culture, it's above politics, it's above, it's objective, right? And so I've been making this argument that, um, uh, first of all, US academic culture is just as locally situated in culture and politics and, and um, history as anywhere else in the world, but its nationalism is manifest as this assumption of universalism, right? And this assumptionism of supernaturalism, that we are uniquely able to transcend the national in a way that people in Latin America or Europe or anywhere else in the world are unable to 
inherently because of their localness, right? So, and that is the nationalism of the US, right? That's the way its, it's uniqueness is, is manifest. Um, and in terms of the way this comes across in um, people's exca actual excavation patterns, and I should say that the, the responding critique from Chileans, of course, was just like, well, you're just neo-colonial. You're all imperialist. Um, you're coming, like, you have enormous research projects because you have this imperialist mentality, and you don't care about the details, the empirical details, because you just want to come in here and throw your money around and say big statements that you can't support because you're so arrogant. So it's not like they... I, I'd never want to sort of assign victimhood and blame because there, I'm interested in, in how each side is constructing their own sense of their own rationality and scientificness and justifying their own way of doing things through these kind of arguments and contrast with each other. Um, but yes, in terms of their excavation practices, I mean, everyone just does the excavation the way they've always been taught to excavate, right? And this is an argument I make in lots of my work, like and we were talking about yesterday, so many of our excavation practices are just black boxed and like, why do we use sieves and not sieves? Uh, you know, why do you employ uh, archaeological, st uh, like students to excavate as opposed to workers, as opposed to prisoners we heard about earlier? Like, if you, does anyone really drill down into which is the most objective system? You know, and you could argue it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I was really struck by your distinction between being in the field all the time, everywhere, for the North American archaeologists, and the distinction of the field as a, as a temporary space and then returning to home. Because I, I was thinking about certain maybe this fits into the world of nationalism and, I, and, and you'll help me understand better with your, with your answer perhaps, but I was thinking about e examples of um, local archaeologists claiming a kind of emic understanding of ancient cultures by virtue of being from that country. And I wonder if that influences the way in which the, the field is still the field everywhere and if that is part of the nationalistic claims or if that's an entirely separate category and uh, I'll take my answer off the air. Yeah. Um, that is really interesting. It's not something I encountered in my um, cases. Um, I don't think the South American archaeologists would claim to be able to better understand the past, um, but they might claim that they have better interests um, at heart than people from abroad. And I think that was definitely the case with um, some of the ways that the Chileans interpreted the field school. Um, and this is something I go into elsewhere, but the, the whole idea of having uh, archaeology student, or students who are not even archaeology majors come to Chile, pay enormous amounts of tuition to excavate these incredible mummies um, was seen as deeply offensive um, because of the broader history of um, the fight for free education in Chile and the idea that you should only work on archaeological projects if you are a professional and intent, like you have a respect for the archaeological material and you're doing it because you are intending to, to continue a career um, in understanding the science but also one's, n one's national patrimony. So it's more a sort of construction of we are um, more responsible stewards than you people who are just exploiting the archaeology for money and for monetary gain, um, rather than necessarily saying we understand the past better. Um, it's more like we are more ethical than you are um, because we're not imperialists, right? <laughs> Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I think that was very fascinating. Um, I was just kind of wondering, you, you made a kind of a distinction between North American archaeologists and, and kind of South American ones, but I have had this, I'm not an archaeologist and I'm kind of, I'm, I know that I'm, I'm risking now that you're going to take me behind the building and not digging me up, but digging me down. But uh, kind of in a way that this is not uh, only between different nationalities, but there is this kind of a, that there is this archaeology that's kind of a common to all archaeologists around the world. And uh, then there is kind of this way how we locally do things. Uh, 
and they are they are kind of the same, but they are the same same but different, uh, kind of sort of. And uh, the local discussion is m could be more practical maybe, and then the kind of the the more uh, the kind of the general uh, the archaeology, that's not not the local things, but the archaeology in general. It's more probably a little bit more kind of a high level to a certain extent, more abstract. Uh, it's going in English, maybe in classical archaeology, uh, still a little bit in some other languages as well, but but that there is kind of, a, it's not between different groups, but it's it's also between uh, kind of within one person, kind of a, a little bit being in, in different, yeah, well, epistemological spaces at the same time. That's interesting. I don't. I would push back on the idea that you could separate out the scientific practice and everything else. And and really, the argument I want to make is that everything is is connected in this. Um, and to see the connections, the similarities, and the the way that um, um, things like what is considered the appropriate way to hang out on a field site and like drink at the end of the evening and to joke with each other and to be friends is connected to the ways in which one recognizes each other's expertise while excavating or analyzing. And these things can't be separated. Um, and that the um, recognition of another person as an expert um, uh, is not just in the way that they write and not just in the way they hold a trowel, um, but also in the way that they um, express themselves the way they, not just the words they use, but the way they um, uh, uh, perform a kind of expertise in their, their whole manner. Um, and this is, you know, this is culture in the most classic kind of way. So I, I would sort of resist the idea that you can separate out, this is just the archaeological scientific bit and this is everything else that varies by country, because I think they're all enmeshed. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm not kind of trying to make a kind of a distinction. They mm. they kind of really go into each other, but uh, but that there will be would be, yeah. I don't know. I have had this kind of a feeling that there might be some kind of an oscillation between uh, two things that really kind of go into each other. But thank you. Yeah, you did ask my question. As you know, uh, this is Betsy Robinson, uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, as you know, I come from a university that has a very strong uh, uh, global South American um, archaeology program. And what I've seen is that a lot of the students in that program are now uh, Bolivian and Peruvian. And I'm wondering uh, if your research, if you're going, if you've been interviewing them, or if you'll track them back into their careers. I think some will go back and have careers um, in Peru, Bolivia, uh, Chile, while, while others are now starting to get jobs in the U.S., so they're going to be having that cyclical life that you're describing. Yeah, absolutely. So that was definitely something I was looking at um, in the case of both Bolivians and Peruvians who come to the U.S. and Chileans who are just starting to come abroad to get PhDs. And, and one of the ways I'm thinking about this is in terms of um, just assumptions that, that people uh, on either side make about the legitimacy or superiority of each other's education and academic community. So the thing that was very interesting to me is that, and I think I was talking with someone about this at lunch, yeah, we were talking about this at lunch, that the, um, uh, the education system, the university system in South America is, is not the same and is not comparable with the liberal arts model of a BA, MA, and PhD in, in the US. So if in the US you do a, a four-year, very general education that's designed to make you into a good citizen and an informed person, and then you specialize in a sort of six to nine year long PhD, in Chile you do a licenciatura and a titula profesional. So they're two different degrees and you spend, um, uh, right from the moment you enter the university at the age of 18, you are becoming an archeologist. You're becoming a professional, becoming integrated into a community. You design a research project. The two degrees together can take about you know, six to nine years. But what we're finding is that when those students then are being told that they need to get a PhD to be taken seriously on the global field, right? to be taken seriously by foreigners, it doesn't matter that you've spent nine years directing your own project. 
you have to go and get a PhD abroad. So at that point, they come across to the US um, and enter into a graduate program, and they will be sitting alongside students who have maybe taken a couple of classes in archaeology and taking introduction to the Inca classes when they've been directing their own excavations on Inca sites for the last you know, nearly a decade. And um, the, what always surprises me is the extent to which people in the US who've been working in South America for many years don't necessarily see it as necessary for them to educate themselves on the education systems in the country they work in. And some do, but some don't, right? And so in the ch case of the Chilean project, there was just this assumption that a student entering grad school in the US was about to begin his, his or her real education and that everything they'd done before was gonna be inferior because they're just nationalists, they're just kind of empir empirical, they don't really care about theory. So um, the, when I interviewed students who've been going through this process, there's a lot of um, ambigu ambiguity there and, and sort of like they've made the decision to move to another country, right? But then how do they negotiate that identity as being subsumed within North American archeology span but expected to go home at the end of that? Um, or if they do stay in the US, then how does that separate them from like, like why is it assumed that they've done really well if they get a position in the US as opposed to going home? So it's very complicated, right? <laughs> and, and I think um, um, it's a difficult thing to talk about and to, to sort of unpick because again, it's like everyone has the best intentions at heart, but these are really, these are, these are structural issues that go beyond uh, one person's ethical decisions. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, it's um, Matt Edgeworth here. Um, yeah, in your fascinating account of circularity, it just reminded me of uh, something we had in the UK years ago called the digging circuit. And um, that was something very much to do with uh, a kind of skilled volunteer labor force who would move around from one site to another in circular seasonal fashion. And I think that got replaced by kind of professionalism and the economic cycles of boom and bust and everything. So, um, and what got, what got left out when one kind of circularity replaced another was that skilled uh, volunteer labor force, which is no longer taking a part. And so, uh, yeah. One of the things I often think about is, um, you know, it's not just in these kind of examples from South America, but if we think of the way that um, people who excavate all year round, contract archeologies, uh, CRM, like their skills are also considered to be just data production, right? And therefore less skilled. It's like anyone who just remains in the field, whether the field is South America or the field is just the field in the UK, is sort of tainted as being not really um, um, as expert. So you can see that same kind of structure uh, in places like the UK as well. Um, yeah, yeah, like to, to not leave the field Marx one is not really as analytical or expert. And you can see it in the way that we talk about, you know, I'm a fine specialist, I'm a bone specialist, but no one ever says I'm a field specialist in that kind of way. We talk about diggers and workers, but we don't call them excavation specialists because it, it's all part of like that devaluing that, that particular location of the field as opposed to the movement out of it. Yeah. All right. It's a very uh, complex a very, very complex uh, theme, and um, we all feel uh, quite concerned in very different ways by your uh, uh, remarks in our, um, uh, in our collaborations, in our f uh, foreign, with foreigners, foreign archaeologists, because we do have the same things, and uh, in our, even in our collaborations with, between academics, archaeologists, in academia and 
in the archaeological service, which is uh, are two different things, and uh, they, they, they depend very much on the institutional framework, on laws, uh, 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 registering uh, archaeology and archaeological, uh, um, because uh, perhaps Bolivian, Bolivian and Chilean archaeologists do feel responsible uh, according to the laws uh, of their country uh, because they have the finds in their uh, storerooms and because, I don't know, they are responsible on them. Uh, do they publish together? Do, uh, do they, um, beyond, beyond the field, do they work together? Um, uh, it depends. Uh, it depends. In some circumstances, yes, some not. Right. The, the Chilean project mm. collapsed so dramatically mm. that mm. nothing really continued from it. Mm. But, but there, yes, there are, there are cases where um, Bolivians and North Americans absolutely publish together. But it's, 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 if you're constantly missing out on all those other interactions, like the hanging out together at the mm. university, hanging out together at a conference, you know, mm. you're missing that particular dimension of collaboration that's so important, the informal dimension that's so important to generating really strong intellectual conversations, right? 